Hello, I'm Lorette Legan, the president of the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee, I want to thank you for joining us for our Forum Onslow. The Governmental Affairs Committee of the Chamber works with government agencies on issues that affect our business community. We monitor legislative issues that impact local business. We promote partnerships between business, government, military, and education. And we use these forms to create awareness on topics that are important to our entire community. The sponsor for this Meets the Candidates Forum is Sanders Ford. Sanders Ford is a family-owned Ford store that has been serving Onslow and surrounding counties since 1938. They believe a well-educated community is essential for a strong democracy. Sanders Ford is proud to be a sponsor of this forum, which is designed to better educate the voters in Onslow County. And now I would like to turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Elliot Potter. Hey, and thank you. Uh, my name is Elliot Potter. I'm the co-host of our radio morning show, um, live and local here, 96.3. Uh, some of you have been on our show. I invite all of you to come to our show and be on it. Um, I will say, too, that I've been doing moderating these programs uh, and participating in them for almost 40 years, and I can't remember anything quite like this. Uh, this is a little bit different, especially in terms of uh, U.S. Congress. Uh, obviously, it's a, a watershed election across all party lines, and it, uh, but, it, but it's also being, this is a special election, it's being uh, held in perhaps not the best of circumstances because I know that we are uh, looking to replace somebody who was a friend to Eastern North Carolina and a friend to a lot of us here, uh, Walter Jones. But, uh, but, you know, the circumstances are what they are. And uh, we are certainly uh, very glad to have each of you here and what terrific interest we have had uh, in this race. We've had to change the format a little bit because of the size of the, of the, of the field. Um, let me explain a little bit to you what we're trying to do. The questions will be general in nature. Uh, and, and this is like we do all of our four Monzo's here. Uh, they're related to issues. Uh, these issues are going to be about the third district in our region and our nation. Um, they were developed by me with some input from some members of the Governmental Affairs Committee. Uh, we like to say that these are intended as forums and not debates. And the reason we say that is because we are asking the candidates to address the questions that we present to you uh, rather than remarks addressed to each other. Uh, you will each get an opportunity to make introductory remarks. Uh, that will be during the first uh, appearance at the podium. And after that, you will be called up again for a, sec for a summation. Again, uh, the candidates at the first round will be called to the podium in a random order. Uh, I will use the same basic set of questions. So there are going to be questions that I want to ask each of you to answer. And then there are going to be some others that I'm going to rotate through. Uh, because you, it's impossible to ask everybody every question because of the time constraints that we have. Uh, but each, ca each candidate will have uh, five minutes total. That's after you answer your introductory question. So you'll have five minutes total, and I'll throw you as many questions as we can get in with, the, of course, as I explained to you earlier, uh, one-minute time limit for each question is what we hope that we can, uh, we can go by. The exact number of questions will be determined by how quickly you can get through them. And then after that, again in random order, we're going to call you to uh, recall you to the podium. If you, got a, if you heard a question that you didn't get a chance to answer, if you heard somebody say something that you maybe want to offer a different point of view on, or if you just want to talk about your campaign, that's your 90 seconds to do it. So uh, we'll wrap it up with that. And... Uh, for the audience, I would only ask that, and, and the audience has done great uh, in the past, but we, we would ask that we would give all these folks a round of a hand right now for showing up, and we appreciate it very much. And we would then ask that we not clap again until the program is over, uh, so that, that we keep it fair that way. All right, I would ask the candidates if you have any questions about how we're going to proceed. And if you don't, then I'm going to call uh, Kevin Becko to the podium.
Gavin, please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this race. I care about our country and its constitution. We must defend it. I fight for our freedom of speech. I fight for our right to bear arms. I fight for our privacy. I fight for our parental rights and the rights of the unborn. I fight to limit welfare from disempowering those in need and to commit to warfare only when justly declared. I fight to fortify our borders and to protect our national identity. I fight for free market with less regulation and lower taxes. I fight to end the war on drugs and the prohibition of medical cannabis. My name is Kevin Baco. I fight for liberty. I fight for the equality of opportunity. And I fight for you. Okay, thanks. All right, so now we're going to proceed with the questioning. Um, if the next congressperson from the 3rd District, congressman, congresswoman, is a, is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided house? Hmm. Well, a Republican form of government was designed with checks and balances to limit its ability to force change on us. So I don't think that political gridlock is necessarily a bad thing. Putting partisanship over representation, that's a bad thing. One thing that I think really unifies both libertarians, Democrats, and also Republicans is medical cannabis. It's a, um, in North Carolina, Polls indicate 80% of North Carolinians support the legalization of medical cannabis. And I think it's because they recognize it as a safe, effective treatment for a wide variety of health conditions. And it's unfortunate that our state legislature has been refusing to um, support that issue. I think it does more harm than good. Okay. Um, up to $500 million in projects at state's military bases, including Camp Lejeune, New River, and Cherry Point in the 3rd District, could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has said such plans could have an adverse effect on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Well, obviously we need to prioritize our military needs but it seems to me that we should place our bases on U.S. soil at a higher priority than bases overseas. It seems to me there are quite a few bases that probably have outdated strategic value. So that is how I would approach that, is, is put the priority on our bases on U.S. soil. Okay. Uh, the, the future of Obamacare is again being called into question legally and politically. What do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think we should let it go. I think that uh, government tends to, government doesn't do health care well. I, I see that health care is a service, not a right. We certainly have the right to go to a doctor and negotiate a price, but we can always go to another doctor to negotiate another price if it's not a mutually beneficial arrangement. So. You know, I think the free market does more for health care. Uh, it increases our choices, it increases our quality, and it minimizes costs. The more the government gets involved, the more our choices go down, our quality of care drops, and our um, prices go up. O Obamacare is a case in point. The 3rd District now includes a substantial portion of North Carolina's coastline, and the issue of offshore drilling continues to create debate in the region. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? As a Currituck County resident, I am opposed to um, drilling, seismic testing, fracking, 
what have you. I think it, uh, I don't want it in my backyard and I would extend the courtesy down the coastline. I think that it not only endangers our local communities and our wildlife, it also um, threatens our regional um, industries like fishing, crabbing, tourism. So I would be opposed to such things. Honestly, I think that there are other ways that we can maybe harness energy in the area. Um, tidal energy and wind power seem like reasonable ways. We have ample resources in those directions. And we got time for one more question here. Uh, what do you see as the top concern facing America's veterans, and how would you what well, and how would you address that issue? Hmm. The top concern. You know, I have a lot of patients that are veterans, and I see PTSD <coughs> quite often. Most most patients who come in who say they're veterans are there because they have PTSD, and um, it's a real problem. I. I have found that medical cannabis, honestly, is the best treatment for PTSD. And I, that's one of my causes that I'm championing, is to legalize medical cannabis, not only at the <laughs> state level, but also at the federal level. I would, I would deschedule cannabis off the FDA's schedule of controlled substances. Okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, next to the podium will be Phil Shepard. Um, please take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you uh, from the other candidates in the race. Thank you, Elliot. It's good to be in Onslow County tonight. It seems like we've been all over the eastern seaboard, but it's good to be home tonight. First of all, I am Phil Shepard. I was born and raised in eastern North Carolina right here in Onslow County. I worked... Um, 36 years with the Marine Corps Base at Camp Lejeune. I've been a bivocational pastor since 1997. And also, I guess what distinguished me uh, as something different, I've served in the North Carolina General Assembly for eight years, working on my fifth term, which gives me the opportunity to be a servant of yours. And also as a pastor, I'm a servant to people as well. And uh, I think that distinguished me a little different than some other people. And I've enjoyed being a servant and doing what I think is right for the people of Eastern North Carolina getting your input and making decisions based on what's best for you and what you all ask me to do. And I appreciate you. If the next congressman for the third district is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided house? Well, Elliot, I think that uh, the issues that we can look at, that we can agree on, it certainly wouldn't be any issues such as um, right to life and those issues because I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand firm on those issues, my conservative values and my moral values. But there are some issues when it comes to infrastructure and so forth and bringing back funds to eastern North Carolina. For instance, a couple years ago, I went to Washington, D.C., and we lobbied the Department of Transportation for funds for our ports at Moorhead City and Wilmington. And those are areas that I'm willing to compromise on in order to get funds for Eastern North Carolina. And uh, after doing that, we did receive funds for our ports at both at Moorhead and Wilmington. And so we were able to keep our channels cleared out and so on and so forth. <coughs> so infrastructure is the area that I really work on, uh, trying to provide funds for better VA centers here in Eastern North Carolina. I know in, here in Oslo County, I get a lot of complaints from veterans because they have to wait in long lines or the facility is not adequate enough for them. So those are the areas that I would be willing to work on with uh, the Democrats as well as Republicans. Okay. Um, up to $500 million in projects at the state's military's bases, including Camp Azure, New River, Cherry Point, uh, could be impacted by the president's de declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps just this week has said that such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Well, I certainly wouldn't support uh, anything that would affect our military readiness or our bases here at Camp Lejeune or at uh, Cherry Point, New Rivera Station. I think they're very vital. I believe we need a strong national defense, which also helps on the border. But I also think that we can fund that without taking money from the military. So I'd work to probably alleviate some of the uh, funds that we're sending for aid over to foreign countries that are not our allies. We're sending a lot of foreign aid over to countries that are not our allies, that do not support us, and I'm sure there'd be plenty of money in that 
a budget to put toward the, uh, the wall. Also, when you build the wall, you have to think about it in the millions and billions of dollars that you're going to save because you're keeping illegal drugs from coming into this country that's destroying our children, our young people. Also, we're having to pay extra in our school system and our health system and also uh, with our security forces and law enforcement because of what's happening at the border. So building the wall would also return more money to the budget to do other things with. <clears throat> uh, some farm operations in North Carolina have been the subject of federal lawsuits and judgments in the millions of dollars. Some farmers believe their very existence is at stake. What, if anything, should Congress do to intervene? Well, as far as Congress is concerned, I can say this. We as the North Carolina General Assembly this past year intervened. Our, our farmers, especially our pork farmers, were under attack. Um, they were going by the rules that were put into place by the North Carolina General Assembly several years ago, so they were obeying the law and doing what they were supposed to do. But then they came under attack because some lawyers from another state came in and pointed out some things that they didn't think were right. They went around eastern North Carolina and told a lot of neighbors that bought their homes knowing the hog farms were there, and then after they bought their homes there, they started complaining about the smell and so forth. And the lawyers basically promised these people millions of dollars in settlements if they would take the farmers to court. So we intervened to help with that and to help the farmers in that situation because I believe it was the right thing to do. Because if we don't have farmers, we don't eat. And personally, I like to eat. <laughs> what is your position on climate change and how it should affect or would affect uh, national policy? Well, what I base my information on, I want the facts and the figures. I want scientific information that is proving that something really is going on there. And I, there's a lot I don't know about it. But I also believe that as part of nature and part of the world that we live in, that climate change has been going on for years. And some things are just naturally occurring along our coast and in our country. Uh, but I will entertain listening to facts and figures that are scientific, that prove that there is climate change or there is not climate change. But I believe our world is transitioning all the time. Our earth is transitioning all the time. And we need to do all that we can ourselves. Take responsibility. Keep your neighborhood clean. Keep your roads clean. Also, that we should do all we can to uh, practice clean, cleaning in our environment, taking care of uh, things like that. Most farmers that I know, and I grew up on a, a farm, they were very uh, effective when it came to taking care of the environment. They wanted to because that's their livelihood. Can I trust you to give me a 10-second answer? What's the top concern facing America's veterans? Top concern facing America's veterans? Uh, well, PTSD is one thing that's very important to them, but also okay. it's handling, finding facilities. <laughs> but I, just, I just wanted to get you to fill out your five minutes, but I appreciate it. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Are you through with me? I am done with you. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Nix. Would you take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience here and highlight what you feel distinguishes you uh, from the other candidates in this primary? Sure. For the past four years, I've traveled more than 175,000 miles and visited 93 counties as the vice chairwoman of the North Carolina Republican Party. I'm Michelle Nix, and I didn't just wake up yesterday and decide to run for Congress. I've been working and traveling in this district and helping to elect Republicans and support President Trump's agenda. My friends on the stage are all going to tell us the same things. We all support President Trump. We all want to build a wall. We all support our military. We all want to defend the right to life. And we all will support our Second Amendment rights. But friends, I have been working in the trenches. I have a track record of crisscrossing North Carolina and helping support our president and our conservative agenda. And if you send me to Washington, I'll promise to work just as hard for you as I have worked here in this district and across our state. No one will outwork me. I'm Michelle Nix. I'm asking for your vote, and I look forward to being your representative in Congress. Okay. Uh, let me start with the questioning here, and I will ask you the same question I've asked the others, and that is, as a Republican, uh, if you were elected to be a next, uh, the next Congress man or woman from this area, 
uh, whichever you prefer, uh, you would enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel will hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided house? Well, while I will certainly understand, you know, working together in a bipartisan effort, I will not compromise my conservative principles. However, I would be willing to negotiate on behalf of the people of the 3rd District, and I think I would be able to sit down with those people and have them direct me on which issues they think that we may be able to negotiate a best deal for the 3rd District. Okay. Up to $500 million in projects at state's military bases, including Camp Lejeune, New River, and Cherry Point in the 3rd District could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the, na of the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has said such plans could have an adverse effect on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Well, I certainly understand that we want to have a safe and secure border, and I can, I can understand the military's concern, especially down here in this area. I don't believe the two are mutually exclusive. I believe that we do need to have a strong border and we need to protect our citizens. That's the first duty of government is to protect its citizens. So I do think that by protecting our border wall and, and, and um, the military would be better served because we wouldn't have to divert resources if we were to have a strong border. And when I'm in Congress, I will work with other members to ensure that we do have strong border security and our military has the funding it needs to protect our, our, our citizens. Okay. Uh, the future of Obamacare is again being called into question, both legally and politically. Uh, what do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? It should be killed. <laughs> the Affordable Care Act needs to be repealed 100% and wholeheartedly. Um, health care is not really a concern here. What the problem is is health insurance. And I think that with the um, uh, district here in North Carolina, there are a number of things that we can take a look at to help, um, uh, um, help the citizens or help the uh, people of the third district with those concerns. The, uh, what do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you may feel uh, could be necessary going forward? Well, I, I, I understand. My grandmother is a Social Security recipient, and so is my mom. And I think we should protect the benefits for the people who are receiving them. However, for the people who are currently paying into those benefits, I think it's going to be an issue. They should have the right to choose how their funds are being invested. So I would like to see Social Security privatized for those people who are paying in. But we do need what, to do what we can to protect those who are receiving the benefits and also ensure that those who are receiving benefits are entitled to be receiving those benefits. And as the next Congresswoman from the 3rd District, I will work with other members to ensure that Social Security is protected for those who are receiving them. Some farm operations in North Carolina have been the subject of federal lawsuits and judgments that have gone into the millions of dollars. Some farmers believe their very existence is at stake. What, if anything, should Congress do to intervene? I'm not sure Congress should do anything to intervene because I think we need to get that out of the way and let the free market work. If there are issues, then we need to reduce regulations and reduce taxes um, and, 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 well, let the free market work again. Okay. Um, the issue of immigration is a complex one. It continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved? Securing the border. Our border needs to be secure. The problems with immigration and with the uh, illegal entry into our southern border is a major issue. There is major problems with human trafficking, with opioid addiction. The border needs to be secure. And as the next Congresswoman from North Carolina, I'll work with other members to ensure that happens. Um, what is your position on climate change? My position on climate change is I believe that we do need to make sure that we have a safe, clean environment, and we owe it to our children and our future generations to ensure that happens. But we don't need to do it at the expense of the government and an expanding government. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Greg Murphy.
Good afternoon, everyone. Well, well, and, well good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> Talking to you, too. And, uh, uh, would you take a minute to introduce yourself uh, to the audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this primary? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Greg Murphy. I'm a surgeon in Greenville, just up the road in Pitt County. I'm also beginning my second term in the North Carolina House of Representatives, and I'm running for Congress. I've looked at this opportunity as one to demonstrate my conservative values. I fashioned myself to be a Ronald Reagan conservative. What does that mean? That means that we have less government, that we have lower taxes and more personal liberty. I see in my practice every day the abuses of personal responsibility, and I feel that that is something that our nation needs to turn back to. We dialed back the clock in 1965 when personal liberty and personal responsibility, rather, went out the window. I feel like it is important that we obviously support our president. He is the leader of our country and someone who needs our backing as in, the, as in, the, uh, in Congress. Why am I running? I feel like I have been a servant for the people of Eastern North Carolina for the last 25 years as a surgeon. I know the people. I know their needs. I know their wishes. And I feel like I am the best one qualified to serve them. All right. Thanks, sir. Um, let me ask you, if the, as a member of Congress, uh, from the 3rd District, if it's a Republican, uh, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? Well, as a, as a member of Congress, we, that we literally walk in as literally the lowest member, the youngest member, and in the minority party. And if you have something to offer, I think in that instance, we're being literally the newest member, I think that's important. You look at one issue that actually intertwines every single segment of our society, and that is health care. Our national system now is broken. We now spend one out of every six dollars of our gross domestic product spending health care. The most important cost sometimes coming off of an assembly line is actually health care for the workers. We have Obamacare, and I'll go ahead and speak to that, which is an, indeed a broken system that needs to be fixed. I look at that particular issue as a threat to us in the future. We are outspending our ability to care for our future adults or care for our future people, and I believe that's the one issue that actually needs to be addressed with immediately. Okay. Uh, I'm asking everyone this question, which is up to $500 million in projects at the state military of the state's military bases, including Camp Lejeune, New River, Cherry Point, could be impacted by the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has, has said such plans could have an adverse effect on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? The Commandant has a Title X obligation to recruit prepare uh, individuals for combat and to defend our country. The southern border is a defense of our country. It needs to be fully funded. Yet I believe there is truly so much other fat in our government. If you look at other government programs and you look at the way our deficit is running out of control, we are spending money and money in other in in instances in other countries that needs to come back to the United States. I don't think our military needs to take the brunt of putting up a border wall in our southern, on our southern border. What do you see as the uh, top concern facing Americans, veterans, and how would you address that issue? I believe it's health care. I believe it's health care for a lot of our aging, growing veterans. I believe it's post-traumatic stress. I believe it's traumatic brain injury. I've actually introduced legislation in the North Carolina House to help deal with that. We look at those individuals who have literally put their life on their line to serve our country. They've sacrificed their life, their families, and everything for us. When they come back, they have problems adjusting back to our society. A lot of them are health care problems. I've actually worked in a VA system. I've been, I was a surgical resident, and I've seen the inefficiency that goes in that system. Without a doubt, we need leadership in that avenue to create a program for our veterans that's actually something that they can be proud of, and that's because they will get good health care. Well, what do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? The future of Social Security is a dim one. Um, you know, when they came out in Social Security in 1965, they labeled the age of 65 as um, the age. If that were done today, calculations would be where those individuals would actually be not available, or be rather available for government assistance, that age would be 92. We need to protect those individuals who are now are in health care, but actually now give some realistic expectations of individuals who are paying into the system, who will have that in the future, that that system probably won't be the same for them in the future. 
There is privatization. There are, there are savings accounts that individuals need to start planning, actually, with personal responsibility for the future. We cannot make future promises that will bankrupt our country. Um, what is your position on climate change and how it should affect national policy? I think it's based upon science. If you go back and you look at the fossil record, our Earth is over 5 billion years old. If you look at times, the Grand Canyon was created with, with water. We've had climate change throughout the millennium, throughout the years of our existence. Is our, what, the real question is, are we as humans affecting climate change? And I think the science, to be very honest with you, is very mixed. Are we actually able to change the clock that the Earth has been on? And I don't think that question has been answered. I don't think it should affect our economy. I don't think the Green Deal pulling back things completely, will bank I think the Green Deal will bankrupt our country. Uh, in about 30 seconds, if you can, um, the issue of immigration is a complex one. It continues to divide the nation. What do you think are the key concerns that need to be resolved? I think the, th the key concerns, we're all immigrants in this country, one, for one form or another. The key concerns is that we have good laws on the, on the, in the law book right today. We're not enforcing them. We actually have, I've, I've talked to individuals who have come into this country legally. Those are the ones who are most incensed and most infuriated. The individuals can come in just by walking in. They've worked hard, they've gone through the process years and years. We need to actually enforce the laws that we have, have a, have a, a physical border in, in our southern border, and actually take care of the individuals that come into our country legally. Well, thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Gary Sierras. Hi, Gary. Uh, please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in the race. Well, my name is Gary Series, and um, there's a few things that actually distinguish me in this race. Number one, I was born in the socialist state of New Jersey, but I chose to come here. Um, number two is I'm a member of the working class. I'm a plain spoken guy. I'm not going to come up here and regurgitate talking points and platitudes. I'm going to offer solutions working class solutions. And when I say the working class, I include the middle class, I include our farmers, I include our fishermen, I include our people that go out there and work nine to five, our soccer moms. We're unheard. We are ignored by the elites of both parties. I'm also not going to come up here and give you a biographical sketch and tell you that I deserve this position, that I've earned this seat. This is the people's seat. I believe in citizen legislators and that's what I would be. If the next member of Congress from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. It has been pointed out, but not a whole lot of seniority. Uh, what issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic about getting a lot accomplished in the, in the next House. And I'll tell you why. Because I believe compromise to the Democratic Party means surrender. And I refuse to surrender the principles of conservatism. I refuse to bow down and just work with the other side and have politics as usual. We have real issues in this country, and there is no compromise on socialism. There is no compromise on a new deal. There is no coming up with an alternative to these issues as well. We need to educate the public, we need to be firm, and we need to propose things. We need to actually take action and solutions, not just vote on things and tell people how we vote it. Okay. Uh, what do you see as the future of Social Security? I see the, social, changes that the future of Social see. Security is, is dim, as Dr. Murphy um, has said. However, I do agree that we need to privatize at some point in the future. But we can't just mandate privatization. We have made a promise to our seniors. So what I would suggest is that our younger people be allowed to opt into a system like our government employees have, where they can invest in different stock options. The up to $500 million in projects at states' military bases <clears throat> could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, has said that such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for? I reject security? the entire premise. I think that this is a democratic talking point. I think everyone ha so far that has given an answer has given the politically correct answer of saying that they're not going to harm the military. Let me give you a quick story. I worked for the, the Department of Defense in San Diego in the Public Works Department. In July, uh, the fiscal year ends. Someone approached my office 
the last day of the fiscal year and said, we need to spend $100,000 today so that our budget is not cut. Go buy pencils. $100,000 worth of pencils were spent in one day. The money is there. This is a complete and total democratic tactic to oppose the wall. We must reject it and we must point this out. We're not cutting anything. Okay. The third district now includes a substantial portion of the North Carolina's coastline and the issue of offshore drilling continues to create debate in the region. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? It is completely irresponsible of any federal legislator to stand in the way of economic development. Completely irresponsible, especially when we have in this district an unemployment rate which exceeds the national average. We have a per capita income that is lower than almost any other district in the country. If this is going to provide jobs, we need to support it. Their, their environmental impact of it is minimal. It has been, it has been propagated by left-wing groups that there would be an economic impact because they believe in socialism. This is all, all the opposition to this comes from left-wing groups. What is your position on climate change and how it should affect national policy? Climate change is a neat way for elites to say the word weather. <laughs> Period. <laughs> what do you see as the top concern facing America's veterans and how would you address that issue? The top concern is that under the Obama administration, the Veterans Administration was gutted. Not only was it gutted, the services that were offered to our veterans were obliterated. My father is a veteran, and he had to wait seven months to get ocular implants. This is insane, uh, to get an appointment to get ocular implants. We need to support the President's reforms of the Veteran Affairs Department, but we need to also make sure that our veterans Funding is there, but we also need to make sure that we remove all the regulations that we currently have in place that are keeping our veterans from seeking out private services as well. Um, what do you see as the top concern facing Amer Americans' veterans? And the top concern facing it is what I said. It is that our Veterans Affairs Department needs to be reformed. The services provided to our veterans are abysmal. They're getting better under the Trump administration, but when you have served this country, you should not have to wait 50 days, 60 days to see a doctor. It should be within a few days. It is a shame. It is a travesty that we do this to our veterans. Well, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is Phil Law. Uh, Phil, take, please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you uh, from the other candidates in this primary race. Sure. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Phil Law. I grew up in North Carolina. I've uh, been married almost 18 years, three children, all born in Onsville Memorial. I've been a resident of Jacksonville for almost 20 years. We have a lot of great candidates to my left and to my right. The one thing that they are trying to do is get to know all of the issues and all of the people within the district. Something that I've been doing for five years now. We need someone who is ready to go in DC right now with the issues, with the networks, and that is me. And I am ready to go up there, hit the ground running, and fight the fight for all of you. If the next member of Congress from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? That's the truth of the matter. So the Speaker of the House is Democratic. The Democrats hold the majority. Uh, as a Republican, as a minority, as a freshman going in there, I will have zero power, let alone being on any sort of committees. All the committees have been chosen. Uh, what I would like to focus on going in there is our offices. So right now I've learned that uh, there's been a lot of defections in the congressional office. So going as a new congressman up there, there there's gonna have to be a lot of triage. So I'm gonna have to evaluate the current staff and probably hire a lot of people as well. So that's something that I think is desperately needed here in Eastern North Carolina. We need uh, constituent services as our top number one issue from the congressional uh, individual that's going up there. 
Um, up to $500 million in projects at state military spaces could be impacted by the President's declaration of national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant uh, has said such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Listen, the number one issue that is uh, threatening our national security is our debt. And a large contributor to that debt are our social programs. And a large majority of users of those social programs are non-citizens. We have to secure our border. And if we do not do that, it will affect generations into the future. Our inaction on this has caused this issue, and our indecisiveness on this will doom our country. We have to build the wall right now. It is an investment in our future for a large payoff in the horizon. The future of Obamacare is again being called into question, both legally and politically. What do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? Obamacare has been a disaster, no, no lie about that. I think it cost millions of dollars just to develop the website. Uh, personally, I actually use uh, Obamacare. I'm an individual contractor a lot of the time, so I had to buy uh, medical care on the open market. With my five-unit family, it was uh, $1,500 a month with a almost $13,000 deductible. It is ridiculous. What we need to do is have a conservative solution and try and get government out of the way. We don't need to be picking winners and losers. Let, let's, go, let's allow individuals to buy policies across state lines. Get rid of the medical device tax. Allow the free market to work. We have to get out of the way. Thank you. The third district now includes a substantial portion of North Carolina's coastline, and the issue of off offshore drilling continues to create debate. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? Thank you. So, so this is a very contentious issue, and, and I know if you go one way or the other, you'll anger one party or another. However, as previously stated, our unemployment in this area is, is pretty dire, and I, I feel that the offshore drilling will invigorate the economy out here. And I think it's something desperately that we can utilize, uh, uh, especially with our fishermen that are being regulated out of work. They can transition to this very easily. Um, we can also utilize, and something that I really prefer, is utilize the uh, ports that we have in Moorhead City and Wilmington to offload a lot of this product. It's something that I think we need and something that we can definitely advocate for. The issue of immigration is a complex one that continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved? So we have a lot of concerns about the uh, immigration, not only on the southern border, but also visa overstays. Um, from the border, we see a lot of illegal immigrants that are coming over. That we, The problem is we don't know who they are because we don't know what their criminal background are, what diseases they may have, what they're carrying across the border. We see a lot of these illicit drugs coming over. We want, to, we want the best and the brightest to come to America. We are the beacon of democracy for the whole world. We need the secure border. We need it now. And if anyone tells you otherwise, you go look around the rest of the world. They all have walls. Every single other country does, and they work. You want and a great example is uh, I've been to the border in uh, San Diego, San Ysidro. In the 80s, they, there was no wall, and they had a problem. Now it's one of the most secure spots in the whole country, and they don't have a problem with it anymore. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Paul Beaumont. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, I sure can. <laughs> I do it all the time. Uh, please take a minute to introduce yourself uh, to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this primary. My name is Paul Beaumont. I am uh, a graduate of one of the hardest uh, academic institutions to get into in this country. That's the U.S. Naval Academy. I graduated from there in 1984 with an aerospace engineering degree, and I went on to be a Navy pilot. I uh, par 
probably one of my best successes uh, in life has been my wife, Christine, who has, uh, she and I have been married together now for 35 years. We've lived in this district for the last 21 years, and we have 11 children and five grandchildren. I was accused in Dare County, no, I'm not trying to create my own congressional district, and I continue to apply that philosophy. So my experience uh, after the Navy is in manufacturing, it's in the green industry, it's in the recycling industry, and it's in the Department of Defense. I am well aware of the status of our military readiness in the weapon systems that we have, and would, it would like to serve this district the way I've served Kurtuk County as a commissioner, and bring those skills to bear. If the, if the next member of Congress uh, from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? I think um, it, as the second most junior member of Congress, because I think 09 will be in there in the same run, uh, I, I'm pessimistic as far as how much working together is, gonna, uh, is going to go on. Uh, my entire career has been built on building teams that have been effective from the aircraft I flew. I had an 18-member crew in that aircraft, and you know I'm willing to work with those on the other side of the aisle, but I do not hold out a great hope for that. However, I can, even as a uh, Republican congressman, affect some of the challenges that we are experiencing in the 3rd District, and I'll use the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for example. Government overreach creates an adverse environment for development. In Currituck County, we have multiple projects that have been stymied and stopped by the Army Corps of Engineers, and I believe with leadership and with bringing the concerned parties together, I can see economic benefit by uh, exerting that concern. Um, and I'm sure you've heard this question, but up to $500 million in projects at state's military bases uh, could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. Uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps has said that such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? The key term in both of those statements was could. Uh, and I acknowledge that there may be a risk to some of the uh, military construction and some of the operational readiness concerns that the Commandant shares. Those I would interject as strongly as possible to evaluate those individual programs, but the paramount concern in this country is our border security. It is the only thing that separates us from losing our identity as a country. It's our way of life. And those resources are necessary to preserve not only our, our culture, but in fact, all the illicit activity that's coming across that border from drugs to sex trafficking, et cetera, that has to stop. What, what do you see as the top concern facing America's veterans, and how would you address that issue? As a Navy veteran, I can categorically tell you that, that health care is the number one concern of uh, the veterans. Uh, the, new, uh, the new veterans, right, the younger generations that are coming out, have a significant amount of benefits associated with their government service or their military service, but absolutely veteran care is the greatest concern. I would like to see other options. I, I appreciate President Trump and what we're doing, but I'd like to see increased evaluation of uh, uh, privatizing uh, government health care or uh, veteran health care. Well, what do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? Uh, repeating what's been heard a couple of times, I, the long-term outlook of Social Security is dismal. However, I do recognize the fact that we made a promise to a generation and generations that followed that they would receive Social Security benefits. I believe the U.S. needs to honor that, but I am absolutely in favor of other investment opportunities that we could afford our younger generation and the workers that are either entering in or are young enough to be able to take advantage of other flexibility for long-term retirement. Um, the 3rd District now includes a substantial portion of the state's coastline, and the issue of offshore drilling continues to create debate. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? I am not in favor of drilling for oil off the coast in, in any case. Um, one of the things that's misunderstood many times that are opponents to offshore oil drilling are the fact that seismic testing uh, in use for exploring for oil 
it, that's the oil industry is the only one that would be affected by that, or our, our coastline would only be affected by that. The reality is those that would promote offshore wind, offshore wind uses the same seismic testing necessary in order to construct the towers that those windmills are under. So I would be opposed to any seismic testing and uh, offshore oil exploration. I'd ask that you give me an abbreviated response to this one. Uh, what do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? There's nothing affordable in the Affordable Care Act. Okay. You actually get another abbreviated one. Uh, what about, what's the key concerns of immigration? Key concerns of immigration are that we do not have an expeditious manner to ensure that people that, are, that should be here or have, are willing to go through the process can be thoroughly vetted in order to be uh, able to effectively immigrate into this country. It is an offense to those that did the process legally to watch people that are coming in through backdoor channels and wind up getting the same thing that they fought so long to get and were patient enough to follow the law. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bymond. And our next up is on Michael Speciali. Sir, please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this primary. Everybody has a problem pronouncing my name. It's, it's pronounced Michael. <laughs> Michael Speciali. Uh, what, what differentiates me uh, from, from the other guys is I've got, I'm in my fourth term as a legislator, so I am in the legislature. I've been able to work with everybody up there. I've, I've been referred to as the conscience of the House by leadership. They said, the, the, the phrase they used was, Representative Speciali reminds us of those things that we tend to forget when we get in a hurry to pass legislation. And you bet I do. I read the bills and I make sure that they follow uh, the, the Constitution and things that it's supposed to. I am a retired Marine. That's my lovely wife back there. We've been, next weekend we'll be married 45 years. Uh, she's also my legislative assistant. Uh, okay. If, uh, if the next member of Congress is, uh, from our district is a Republican, he or she will enter the House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? There's a lot of things that we can work on. Regulator regulatory reform, things that we've done in North Carolina that have helped business prosper, that have, that have made things go here. Uh, I've worked with, with the other side. For example, just a quick example that comes to mind. Uh, uh, our EMS, a after an emergency, it, it costs thousands of dollars to run a helicopter through to look at what happened, to look at the flooding after a hurricane or something. Uh, we wanted to make sure they had, had drones that they could use, which is a lot cheaper, and they can still get all the video, everything they need. I wanted the Democrats and the Republicans to vote for this bill, and so I worked with them, and, and we got it. We got it done. There's a lot of things we can work on. Everything doesn't need to be partisan. Uh, up to $500 million in projects at the state's military bases could be impacted by the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. Uh, the commandant has said such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? There's, a, there's enough money going into programs that, that need to be cleaned up. There's enough waste in the federal government where we don't need to do that. That's a, that's a red herring. Uh, uh, it doesn't need to be done. Okay. Uh, some former operations in North Carolina have been the subject of federal lawsuits and judgments in the millions of dollars. Uh, some farmers believe their very existence is at stake. What, if anything, could, should Congress do to intervene? I do believe it is a state issue. I don't believe it's a congressional or a federal issue. And we did in, in the state, as one gentleman had said, uh, we did pass tort reform in that area and we limited uh, the liability because we were getting people from out of state big big time attorneys coming in and trying to convince people that they need to file suit. The issue of immigration is a complex one that continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved? We need to, we need to secure our borders. That's the number one responsibility of government. Any government is the security of the people. Uh, the borders, if you don't have secure borders, you don't have a country. We need to secure it. Then we need to follow the laws that we have. The law, some of the, the laws that we've had on the books were effective for, for decades. And uh, if we were to follow them, uh, we, we'd be able to resolve a lot of the problems. The third district now includes a substantial portion of the coastline of the state. Uh, the issue of offshore drilling continues to create debate in the region. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas of the southeastern coast off the southeastern U.S. coast for drilling for oil and gas? 
One of the things that, that makes this country great is we're able to be self-sufficient, and that includes in energy and providing energy. If we need to drill off the coast in order to keep ourselves self-sufficient, then I certainly support that. The technology has come a long way. The, uh, the spill in the Gulf was, was using old technology. They were, it was poor performance, everything else. We don't have to worry about that. It'd be far enough off the coast. But that's really the whole question is moot because there's not enough money in it. And they're not going to spend, the, the oil company's not going to spend the money, uh, millions of dollars, to pull it out of the ground when there's so much already uh, available on land. Um, what's your position on climate change and how it should impact national policy? I think climate change is a, is a multi-billion dollar scam. Uh, there was, if you remember back a few years ago, and I think a lot of people forgot, uh, computers were broken into and, and a, a lot of paperwork was displayed to the public. Uh, to show that a lot of what was going on was hoaxes. A lot of the paperwork, the climate uh, uh, numbers and everything else, th there is no settled science on it. And until there is, I don't think it's something that we can do anything about. What do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you may be, feel may be necessary going forward? Uh, Social Security is, is, is in its death throes. I think it, probably everybody here would agree uh, something needs to be done. Uh, we need to look at new programs down the line. I would never support uh, uh, anybody that's paying into it or anybody that's getting it. I would never support it changing, I mean, and, and being taken away from them. But I do think that for new people coming into the system, we need, we need to work something else out because this is, it is a Ponzi scheme and it depends on more and more people coming into the workforce to pay for it. Uh, Thirty second answer. What do you see as the top concern facing America's veterans and uh, how much you address that issue? The top concern is health care. Our VA system is, is totally inadequate. It's, it's cumbersome. Uh, I personally, I think veterans should be able to go wherever they need to go to, to local hospitals and, and their government should have some form of insurance to pay for it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Eric Rouse. How you doing? How are you? Mr. Rouse, please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates and on this uh, up there with you. Well, I want to appreciate you having this forum. And as you all can tell, I am from Eastern North Carolina by my accent. I've lived here my whole life. Went, uh, I was born in Kinston, Lenore County, went to East Carolina University, met my wife, brought her back to Kinston. We have two children, Anna and Magnum. Anna, 16, Magnum's 11. I have, and we started our life together, I have five companies that I currently oversee and manage. And uh, I know a little bit about making a payroll. I know a little bit about reading the income statement and staying on budget. And that's a key in today's environment, especially up there. I've got experience as a county commissioner in Lenore County. I'm going on my third term. I've been the sole uh, conservative Republican voice uh, down there, so I know a little bit about working with the other side, and I was able to get things done. Okay. The uh, as the next as the next member of Congress is from the third district, um, as we've said. Uh, if it's a Republican, he or she is going to be a U.S. House uh, going to enter the House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? Okay. Well, as I said, I'm used to working in the minority. And I got things accomplished. Uh, my board actually has put me on several uh, very important positions, RPO, transportation, healthcare, items like that. So what you got to do if you want to negotiate with somebody who's coming in as a lame duck has been mentioned, you're going to have to find a common ground. I think everybody here in this room, one side or another, will agree our veterans and our active duty members are a very easy start. That's where you can find that common ground. You can start working towards trying to build a bond and trying to get them moving to your side. And that's going to be the key. We've got to take care of our veterans. And I think everybody's in for that. So that would be the start. Up to uh, $500 million in projects at the state's military bases could be impacted by the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. Uh, the commandant expressed some concern, saying the plans uh, could have an in adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Well, if Congress just did what they've done for every other president up to this point, we wouldn't be in this position. So now we've got a situation that's escalated. I will tell you, my mother is an immigrant. My best friend who just passed was an immigrant. 
their citizens. Um, they said, Eric, we did it the right way. Everybody else can do it the right way. I do support having the wall. I think we need the wall. I think we need to control who comes into our country. And we need to do like other countries do. And we need to, we need to get the best that's offered. And we need to get the people that will fill the positions that we need over here. We do need a wall. But as Trump said, we need a very big gate or door on it so we can let people in and vet them properly. I do think that's one of the greatest um, security threats we have right now is just when you're able to willy-nilly walk across the border carrying whatever you want, doing whatever you want, that, that's us losing our identity, and that's a national threat. Uh, the future of Obamacare is again being called into question legally and politically. What do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? Affordable Care Act hopefully is on its way out. I'd like to see it disappear completely. I'd like to see us go back to where patients and doctors dictate the care and not the government. The government's not very good at doing anything. Uh, Social Security is a good example. And I think Medicaid expansion would be the same way, but we need to go back to where it's patient and doctor care based. They know what's going on. We also need to open up the private markets and let the free market work. That's what it does. When the free market's going and there's no regulations placed on it, it will drive costs down. That worked in the past. It's a simple supply and demand principle that every kid learns in elementary school. Well, what do you see as the top concern facing America's veterans, and how would you address that issue? Health care. Health care, whether it be mental, whether it be physical, but it's health care. We've got to take care of veterans. We made a promise. These guys have gone through a lot for us, for this country. They believe in it. They've gone and done things that, you know, is just incredible. And we've got to take care of those guys. You, you, like I said, we made a promise. It's, and just in Lenore County, we've got a nursing home that's rated top in the nation for our vets. It can be done. We can have proper care. We've got to get through the bureaucracy. We've got to cut through the bureaucracy that's causing all these problems. I wouldn't be opposed either to some form of privatizing the health care system for the veterans so they can go to different hospitals or they can, instead of waiting in line to try and get in one hospital, they can go over here. If they can't get in at the Veterans Association, they can go to the local hospital and get treatment or they can go to their local doctor and get treatment. Well, what do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? We made a promise to our citizens, our elderly, and there's a lot of people on it, they rely on it. Uh, I do think we need to take a step back, look at it, and actually start allowing people that are younger that know it's not going to be there for them the opportunity to start investing in their own future, whether it, whether it be in stocks, bonds, private set-up programs, where they can do this. Now, if we do that, it'll be successful. The free market, the private market will come in. It'll be successful. And then you'll get back to what it was originally intended, which was a supplement and not a retirement program for the American people. And that's what we need to get back to. Uh, what is your position on climate change and how it should affect national policy? Well, you know, Al Gore told us by now we would uh, all be underwater by about five foot, hundreds of thousands of acres would be uh, underwater. Uh, we're all standing here. I don't see that. I do, I do believe we're coming off, a, and it's scientific fact, we're coming off an ice age. So yes, the climate's going to warm up. Should we do what we can to help the environment? Absolutely. You know, recycle. Take care of the environment. That's our job as people, as stewards of the environment. We need to look after it. But, but we also, you know, we got to understand what's going on, and it needs to be fact-based on, on what's happening. I mean, they can't even predict the weather at the end of the week, so I don't see how they can tell us <laughs> climate change is, is going to happen. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. That's it? That's it, man. Uh, <laughs> I have a minute now? <laughs> yeah. uh, Celeste Carnes. Hello. I hope I pronounced that one right. It's Cairns. Cairns. Yes, okay, Celeste well, Cairns. Good afternoon. Uh, How are you? Okay, uh, please take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this race. Okay. I think what distinguishes me is going to be the combination of everything I tell you about me. Um, I'm not a politician like our president. I'm a CPA. I have... Um, 
practiced for many years with um, the largest accounting and consulting firm in the world and also with the Hospital Corporation of America and spent a lot of time in accounting and finance and auditing. I'm also a military wife of 24 years now. Um, and so the military is important to me. My husband is a retired Special Forces officer who now works for the Marine Corps at Camp Lejeune. I'm a mom of two ECU pirates, one of whom is a contracted ROTC cadet. I'm a conservative woman, both in fiscal matters and in social matters. And I would stand as a direct counterpoint, let's say, to Nancy Pelosi and AOC and some of those ladies of the radical left. If the next member of Cong Congress from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. Mm -hmm. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? You know, I've been poring over this question since I heard you pose it, and I still don't have the perfect answer. I think we have seen from the left um, an unwillingness to compromise, and as Republicans have compromised in the past, we see the nation move more and more left. Um, we see federal government grow from something that was intended to be quite small and uninvolved in our lives to something now that affects us each and every day, takes lots of money and resources out of the district. And so it's hard to say that I would be anything other than someone who wants to stand in opposition to losing more of our freedoms. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this question too, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh -oh. Up to $500 million in projects at the state's military bases could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has said that such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Yes, I read um, General Neller's letter, and I talked to my husband almost every day about what's going on with the Marine Corps. Um, I would absolutely not support diverting funds from the military, but the real scandal is that that's even a question. Um, you know, our national security and our border control is something that the federal government should pay for, and it's this scandal that we could not get the Democrats to approve the funding that we need for border security. So I hate that that's even a question, because to me, they should be mutually exclusive. Uh, the future of Obamacare is again being called into question. What do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? I think it's quite sad that when Republicans had the opportunity to completely dismantle it, they didn't. Um, I would not be one of those Republicans who will disappoint you and say one thing on the campaign trail and change my position or get, um, I don't know what the word is, soft in some of the areas. Um, we do need to get more of the, you know, private I don't know what the word is, get government out of health care. I mean, we can watch as health care costs have gone up over the years. It's as government gets more and more involved. So what we need to do is get back to private markets, let decisions be made between the doctors and the patients, um, and, uh, you know, help with tort reform. I say tort reform. I mean, actually, defensive medicine, um, letting insurance companies sell across state lines. There are a lot of things we can do to bring costs down. Um, what do you see as the top, concerning face, the top concern facing America's veterans, and how would you address that issue? I would say um, America's veterans are Americans first, that they are as concerned about everything in the nation as the rest of us are, that they're not focused solely on their issues. They want the nation to be strong. They want the militaries that they served in to be strong. Um, but there is some concern that the nation would uh, show good faith to them. Um, it is our first priority to, as a federal government, to take care of national security and related to that, then, is to care for the people who are doing that job. So there obviously has been, have been issues in the medical um, care that we're giving them. We need to get the um, 
VA Missions Act fully implemented and implemented well, and uh, just do what we can across the board. We owe them nothing less. The issue of immigration is a complex one that continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved? You know, where do you start? Guys, we've got, I don't, they can't even estimate how many millions of um, illegal immigrants we have in the country. We know that I think between 65, 70,000 uh, came across just last month. Actually, they didn't. Those were the ones that were stopped. We don't actually know um, how many may have made it um, that did not get interdicted. But illegal immigration affects us from a fiscal standpoint across the board, the cost to our medical system, the cost to our education system. Guys, you know, our kids, their schools, um, what we see in the inner city with gangs, what we're dealing with with drugs. There's, there's not one thing that I can say is the most important because the, the, it's a horrible problem across the board. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, is that it? That's it. Thanks. Uh, Francis DeLuca. How are you, sir? Kind of feeling like Elizabeth Taylor's last husband. <laughs> well, maybe you can <laughs> do a little better. Um, please take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this race. I'm Francis Luca, and I'd like to ask for all of your vote for Congress. Um, Jacksonville is kind of a constant in my life. I was born here, grew up here, went to school all the way from Infinite Prague to Jacksonville Senior High School. Then I went to college, joined the Marine Corps. First duty station after flight school was back here at New River, flying 53s. After I left active duty, I joined the reserves, went off, started living a civilian life, called back to active duty with my reserve Huey squadron, came back to Jacksonville to deploy to the first Gulf War flying, came back home, went back to life, got called back to active duty. By this time, I was drilling with two MEF. I got called back to active duty for OIF, came back here, ended up spending six years here on active duty again, and then um, went over, fought not I, o, I, OIF, and now I'm back here running for Congress. In between that, I raised a family, two daughters, two grandchildren, and I ran the Civitas Institute, a conservative advocacy group in North Carolina. Thank you. The next member of Congress from the third district, um, if, it's a, if he or she is a Republican, uh, will enter the House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? Actually, I don't look at it as what issue are you going to accomplish. What issue are you going to lay the groundwork for that when Republicans are back in the majority in 2020 that you can actually get done? And I think probably the, the best hope of working with Democrats is on the veterans' issues because they're always looking to show their military credibility so you can get some people to cooperate with you as we try and improve the health care system for veterans. Up to, up to $500 million in projects at the state's military bases, including, including Camp Lejeune, New River, and Cherry Point in the 3rd District. I pronounced Camp Lejeune three different ways tonight. I hope you noticed that. Well, I grew up calling it Lejeune. <laughs> okay. Not Lejeune like Not the general Lejeune, is yeah, named after. Uh, but it could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has said such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? As someone said before, the key words there are could, because right now we only have a possibility. We don't have an actual fact on the ground, and so we got to keep our eye on that to see what's going to happen. Um, the second part of that, as long as the military has the resources to train and equip the troops back here in the U.S. properly, then the cuts aren't dangerous right now. The other thing is the border wall is a national security item. Any military person will tell you that when you go into a hostile area, the first thing you do is build a wall to keep the bad guys out and keep your people safe inside. And that's what we have neglected to do for years. I went over and fought two wars, came back here, and what happened? Our country had been invaded while I was gone. What do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? Well, Social Security, all the entitlements are big contributors to our national, growing national debt. And that is the single biggest security threat we have. Because if that gets too big, 
won't matter what we try and do, we won't have the money to do it. And if we endanger our currency and, and it loses its place as the reserve currency in the world because people see us printing money, our, rate, our, our fiddling with interest rates to try and pay our bills as interest rates go up, then we lose that reserve currency and we no longer can spend the money cheaply like we've been spending it. So on Social Security, we have to look at it in terms of reducing the growth of it, making sure the people who have already planned on it get it, and then look ahead to start a ramp that takes it down as less of a problem. What do you see as the top concerning facing Amer concern facing Americans' veterans, and how would you address that issue? Well, one of the things I'd like to say is that the military has done a much better job of preparing the men and women to leave the military. It used to be that you left and nothing happened. You know, basically, thank you, quick physical, you're out. Now there's a lot of um, preparations and classes before people leave the military to try and help prepare them. It doesn't help everybody, so that's one good thing. But the health care, as everybody said, is the, is the major problem, and that's where I see that we need to do a major um, revamp of the VA. We need to stop sending people to localized centers. We need to give them the resources to get care in their hometowns with their home doctors and their home hospitals. And that way, we not only let them um, interact with someone they know, we also put needed dollars into the third district medical system. What is your position on climate change and how it should affect national policy? Anybody who follows my Facebook, my personal Facebook page will see that I love warm weather. So if that means warm weather, I'm all for it. But um, I think that, you know, climate change is a occurrence. It, we had several hundred years ago, there was an ice age in Europe, the little ice age. If you look it up, you can see. And that, you know, the climate changes and we just have to be ready to adopt to those changes. We cannot stop them, I believe. What we can do is make sure that we have economic growth so that we have the actual resources to harden our infrastructure and adopt to a changing climate. If we make ourselves poorer, we won't be able to afford to do that. Um, some former operations in North Carolina have been the subject of federal lawsuits, huge judgments and millions of dollars. Some farmers believe their very existence is at stake. What should Congress do about it? Well, I think Congress should do a lot of what North Carolina did over the last few years in terms of tort reform. One of the things they, they can do is stop the punitive damages. People can collect economic damages. In other words, if you want to sue, you can sue but you can only collect what you've really lost. You can't get, we're gonna punish this farm for being a bad neighbor. That's not what the system should do. It should say, okay, if you had a, a financial loss, we will make you whole. But if you didn't have a financial loss, it's not the lottery. Lawsuits should not be a lottery. They should be a way of getting justice. Thank you, sir. Graham Boyd, I see you back there. If you would, please take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in the race. All right. Thank you. Good evening. It started as afternoon and now it's turned into evening. So uh, uh, I'm Graham Boyd. I'm a farm boy from Pine Town, North Carolina. That's in Beaufort County. Went to high school in Bath, North Carolina. Been involved in agriculture my entire career, uh, both there in production ag as well as a leader for uh, two of the agricultural organizations in the state. I went to school at NC State and studied agriculture, have been married for 25 years, have three wonderful children, and I would say the distinguishing factor between me and the rest of the field is that I'm uh, delighted to have the endorsement of Commissioner Ag Agriculture Commissioner Steve Troxler for my campaign in this primary. Uh, if the next member of Congress from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided house? Well, Elliot, I spent a lot of time on agricultural issues advocating on our behalf in North Carolina. Uh, one of the biggest ones, one of the heaviest lifts we ever did was a tobacco buyout, which many of you in the room probably were participants and beneficiaries of. as a $12.5 billion deal, the largest infusion to cash here in North Carolina. I was sitting in the gallery the night that the legislation passed. My point is it takes a good decade to advance monumental topics of that type. So what are the national huge issues that are going to require a bipartisan coalition of working together, the things that really can't be categorized necessarily 
uh, as, as uh, into one camp or the next. Infrastructure. Our president has prioritized it. We all need it. So we need to work across the aisle in unison. What's good for America? Uh, Health care reform. Listen, it's a huge lift. You will not get it through without some coalition and bipartisan of everybody agreeing to put the bickering aside and serve the needs of the people of the United States. Immigration reform is another huge lift, and it will take because it is very divided. Uh, it will take coming together, and then ultimately for us here in eastern North Carolina, disaster mitigation, that's a, that's a na nationwide issue. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I went over my time. That's all right. We'll, uh, we'll stop you next time. <laughs> that's all right. You can finish your sentence at the end of, a, at, the end of that. Uh, up to $500 million in projects at the state's military bases, including uh, Camp Lejeune, New River, and Cherry Point in the 3rd District, could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has said such plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? The Commandant has 100 percent of my support. I oppose uh, taking or raiding or diverting any funds from our military, military services, military personnel has to be our top priority. Uh, we certainly need to find the funding elsewhere within, uh, you know, <laughs> within the trillions of dollars that, that uh, are the appropriations process. We cannot deplete or reduce our military. Some farm operations in North Carolina have been the subject of federal lawsuits and judgments in the millions of dollars. Some farmers believe their very existence is at stake. What, if anything, should Congress do to intervene? Listen, I am acutely, intimately familiar with this one. Um, I'll tell you that uh, in agriculture, listen, there's two points here. If we're free tonight, think a, think a soldier, think a veteran. If your belly's full tonight, think a farmer. Farming is not a nuisance. Uh, we have to protect agriculture. It's obviously the bedrock and engine that drives our rural economies. These frivolous lawsuits, tort reform is one of the ways to address them. I do think it has national implication. I applaud the members of the legislature here who, through the Farm Act, have supported uh, the, the proper controls. But uh, other states are paying attention to this, and they will be next, particularly the, those states that are heavy in agricultural, animal agricultural production, Delaware, Missouri, et cetera. So we have to put boundaries in there to prevent this chase of money, and that's what it is. The issue of immigration is a complex one that continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved? Well, I support the, wa the wall. I think that the wall should have a door in it so that people can have a pathway to citizenship. Uh, my family ancestry goes back to the 1600s in uh, Bath, North Carolina, the oldest town in the state. So uh, we were here before it was a nation, right? Uh, and therefore, there was a gateway to get here. You had to come on a boat. There was one way to get here. There was a control avenue. Listen, walls are all around uh, the world, as I think Phil pointed out momentarily ago. I said it at one of our previous events. The governor's mansion has a wall around it. The Vatican City has a wall around it. Walls work. And you can enter and you can access uh, places appropriately once vetted and once uh, people are confirmed that you have a, a reasonable right to be there. And so with regard to immigration, I think that, that we have to make sure that we understand overwhelmingly most of the people who desire to enter this country wish to do so for the right wholesome reasons. We ought not deter that, but we ought to support a system by which they can come and enter legally and, uh, and enjoy the uh, liberties that they're pursuing. Um, as, and quickly, I need a quick answer from you. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening a areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? Right. Well, I, I would oppose a drilling. I think that there's uh, more study that needs to go on. Uh, to make sure that we understand what kind of technologies can assure the kind of safety uh, to the environment and to the natural resources. And so uh, at this time, that's my position. Okay. Well, thanks. Thank you. And uh, we're getting down to the end, and I know uh, Dr. Joan Perry has been waiting patiently. As you all have also. <laughs> um, Please take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in this race. Thank you. So for the past 33 years, I have been engaged in raising five boys, uh, practicing pediatrics and teaching as well, and thoroughly engaged in the community. 
But what really t pushed the needle to cause me to jump into this fray was watching the New York legislature cheer the passing of the Reproductive Health Act and the Virginia governor shortly thereafter defend infanticide. And as a Christian, as a pediatrician, as a mother, as a grandmother, I thought this was appalling and something that I could speak to. I think right now in Congress, we need a strong female voice speaking to this issue and others. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say that I am not a politician. I don't need another notch in my political belt. I would not, not consider this a promotion, nor would I consider it a career, but I consider it a calling. Thank you. If the next member of Congress comes from the 3rd District, uh, it, it coming from the 3rd District, is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel have the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? Yes, it's such a good question. And indeed, it would be very difficult to jump right in and be able to cross aisles on major issues that are going to require consensus, like health care reform. Um, however, I think that there are issues here in our Eastern District that need to be addressed, especially since we've not had a representative for this length of time. Um, so I would look toward infrastructure, especially as we uh, consider the coastline, Moorhead City Port. I think there's some things that need to be done there, and that's what I think I would start with. Um, again, we, we want to talk, address this question about the uh, $500 million in projects that the state's, ba state's military bases could be impacted by the President's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. The Commandant of the Marine Corps said that such plans could have an I adverse impact on military readiness. What is your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? I think military readiness is our top priority, uh, and I really think it should align with Congress. Um, while I support the building of the wall, I would really support looking at allocations from funding allocations from other sources rather than the military, particularly if it in any way affects military training operations. The future of Obamacare is again being called into question. What do you think should happen to the Affordable Care Act? Well, I am a strong proponent for repealing and replacing. I think we really need to come up with a free market approach, um, one that completely does away with, ins with the insurance mandate, one that um, promotes health savings accounts, which is a, a, a sure tool to bring down, a proven tool to bring down the cost of, of uh, health care. I think we need to address the big pharma issue and the, pharma the role the pharmaceutical companies are playing in the cost of health care. Um, and, uh, and I, I believe that we need to modernize Medicaid rather than expand Medicaid. I think modernization that extends uh, block grants to the states would be the way to go with that. Um, what do you see as the top, concerning facing, top concern facing America's veterans, and how would you address that issue? So I know in my community the, the, and, and several other counties in our district I've spoken to, it is mental health care for uh, veterans. And in our area, many times, because we have such a rural constituency, that means accessibility to mental health care. I think that we would, I would encourage, and, and I would like to approach it legislatively, the development of a network that would provide those kinds of services in rural areas, even if it would be mobile units or using telemedicine. What do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? Well, I think we all agree that, that the future looks dim. However, we have made, our country has made promises to those who have put into the system, and we've got to do everything possible to ensure that. I believe part of that is going to involve uh, entitlement reform, because right now we see that that's 70 percent of our budget, um, and we've got to do something about that. That is really one of the elephants in the room as it's related to national debt. If we can address that, that's going to shore up more money for uh, Social Security. I think, though, for generations that are coming behind us, we've got to be innovative, and we've got to provide them choice with their investment. The 3rd District now includes a substantial portion of the state's coastline, and uh, the issue of offshore drilling has created debate in the region. As a member of Congress, what position would you take on opening areas off the southeastern U.S. coast to drilling for oil and gas? As I understand now, this is truly a cost-benefit um, issue that it makes it no longer as relevant as it has been in the past. However, um, speaking for the district where we have tourism and where we have fishing, the fishing industry, I would, I would be very hesitant to promote that or encourage that or support that. 
And uh, what is your position on climate change and how it should affect national policy? So my default position on climate change is um, to support what the Department of Defense sees as climate change. And they have recognized climate change. In fact, um, they've developed policies and plans to respond to the effects of climate change as it, go as it um, relates to um, assets and operations and missions. Um, I do feel strongly, however, that climate change should never be used um, or leveraged to further a social agenda. I need a 30-second answer from you. What, uh, what do you see as the key concerns that must be resolved with immigration? So I approach immigration like I would a bleeding pediatric trauma patient, and that is, first you have to stop the bleeding, and that would be taking care, securing the border. Then it gives you time to come back in and really look at immigration in general where we need much reform, whether we're talking about um, uh, extended visa stays or chain immigration. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I tell you, I said we couldn't clap for anybody, but I think we should clap for Michael Payment. <laughs> Because he's the final one up to the podium. Let me stretch my legs for a minute. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your patience. No, nah, no. Well, I'm glad um, to. Would you take a minute to introduce yourself to our audience and highlight what you feel distinguishes you from the other candidates in the race? Thank Besides you. Besides being the final uh, one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again podium. for allowing me to come out again. My name is Mike Payment. Easy name to remember. Everybody's got a bill out there. So um, I graduated in Currituck County in 1982. Um, I grew up in Currituck, and at 17, I joined the Navy under President Ronald Reagan, which uh, I learned what a good, strong, respectful military is, and I believe in that. Um, after that, I went to college. I worked at nights, went to college during the day, and worked my way up to where I'm at. I'm a business owner of heating and air conditioning business. I'm also a volunteer firefighter, working with the first responders out there, so I understand what it is to be out there. Um, I do have the experience that, uh, that's required for this position. I have been to Washington. I have met with senators and congressmen as business representatives to discuss policies to, uh, to help them with the fair market and um, get them the, uh, uh, the, 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 the bills passed that they needed in there. So um, I'm up here today to give you a candidate that's a hardworking American who can get the job done for you. Thank you. If the next member of Congress from the 3rd District is a Republican, he or she will enter the U.S. House as a member of the minority party. What issues do you feel hold the most promise for getting something accomplished in a divided House? Again, being up there for the first time and getting in there, a couple of the strong issues I think that will be coming before us is going to be health care and our military. One thing you cannot do going into any, any discussions is, is having a preset decision or sticking your feet in the sand and not, not wanting to budge. I have experience with working with individuals and parties, getting the communication started. Once you get communication started and you get people talking, get the issues out there, you can start moving the process forward. That's what it takes. It takes somebody to get the dialogue going, get the conversation going, get the issues on the table, start the discussions. That's what I do. I have experience in that. That's how you get things done. And I can do that and I will do that. The uh, up to $500 million in projects at the state's military bases could be impacted by the president's declaration of a national emergency. Um, the commandant of the Marine Corps said those plans could have an adverse impact on military readiness. The question is, what's your position on diverting military resources to pay for border security? Okay, I will not sacrifice our military. We need a strong, effective military. Part of being in Congress is you have to find the funding needed for these projects, and that's what I'm going to do. There's a big budget in there. There's wasteful spending. We're sending money overseas. There's a lot of fat. There's a lot of pork. Ridiculous spending that doesn't need to be there. If you can control the spending and start watching where the money is going, you can find the money. It doesn't have to come out of the military, but you've got to be able to stand up, speak out, and look at the budget and find the money out there, and that's what Congress has to do for this president is tell them where the money is and not to take it from the military. <coughs> The issue of immigration is a complex one that continues to divide the nation. What do you see as the key concerns about immigration that must be resolved? Well, the wall definitely needs, we, we need to protect our borders. And if we'd have started doing this earlier, we wouldn't be at where we're at right now. Our current president is a president of action. He was forced into doing something and he got tired of hearing it and tired of listening to people talk it. And you know what he did? He stepped up to the plate and he's doing it. And I applaud him for that and I respect him for that. We need to protect it. There's too much crime coming across the borders. There's, a, you know, digging into my pocket constantly and paying for the benefits of illegal immigration. It, it, it's got to stop. 
And I will support the effort. I'll support the president. I'll support getting that wall taken care of. Um, and um, go for the next question on that one. Okay. What is your position on, um, on climate change and how it should affect national policy? Climate change, the, the earth has been around a long time. It's going to constantly go through climate change. I'm in the heating and air conditioning business. Um, you, one thing we, the, the industry did a long time ago is to help protect the environment. And instead of releasing refrigerants in the atmosphere, they decided to have us reclaim the refrigerant. To me, I thought that was a great idea because refrigerants can work on depleting the ozone layers. So there are certain things we can do to help protect our environment, which I think we should. It's a smart thing to do. My industry does it. But as far as climate change, it's going to occur out there. But you know, if we can do something to help the environment, I'm, I'm all for that too. But we should not put strong federal reg regulations in place. One thing the president said when I went to a briefing up there, for every regulation that's brought before him, he wants them to take away three regulations, and I believe that as well. What do you see as the future of Social Security, including any changes or new approaches that you feel may be necessary going forward? Social Security is out there for a reason, and people are counting on it. But one thing nobody had mentioned up here is our government has been reaching into that cookie jar for years, taking money out of Social Security to fund projects because they saw extra money there that was not being used, and they said, oh, we know it. we'll put a note in there and we'll pay it back. We'll pay it back at some future point. You know what? It's never been paid back. They keep reaching into that cookie jar. That's got to stop. We've got to start putting that money back in there to pay for the, 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 the seniors that are out there. And somebody's got to speak up and say that and, and take care of that, and I'll do that because it's still going on. They're still reaching in that cookie jar, and they're not putting anything back. What do you say <coughs> to the top concern facing Americans, veterans? How would you address that issue? The veterans need the medical assistance, medical care. Um, in my industry, in heating and air conditioning, I've been to the VA hospitals. I've seen patients sitting in the hallways, waiting in line. I've talked to veterans. They've said, well, I've got to wait three days. I've got to go three hours to a hospital. We need to make it more uh, location-friendly. If they need to go to a specialist local, let's just open it up. For them to travel as far and wait as long as it's ridiculous. You know, let's let, the, let's let the, the closest medical facility, the closest specialist, let's make everything available to them. We owe it to them. They defended our freedoms, and we should be taking care of them. So I will do everything I can to make it easy and accessible. Okay, well, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, well, what we did here, we did we went, took a random order, and we're going to do a random order again um, for our summations. You have a minute and a half. There'll be a clock down there. It's sort of timing you. I will remind you, I know that uh, most most of you folks got through a lot of the questions that I had. Uh, if you did, didn't get one that you wanted to answer, now's a good time. Uh, if you heard something that maybe uh, uh, made you want to have another comment or two, that now's a great time. Or if you just want to talk about where your campaign stands, that'll be a good time as well. So uh, we're going to start this off with Francis DeLuca. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank all of you for having the patience to sit through this, the chamber for putting it on. And a little note, this building that you're in used to be a Belks department store and a gas station. So kind of the history of it. Now it's a beautiful city hall, you would never know. Um, I want to follow up on, I didn't get a chance to answer the immigration reform question. And someone said, we need to uh, secure our borders before we do any comprehensive immigration reform. Back in the 80s, President Reagan signed an amnesty bill and was told that the border security would come after that. We're still waiting on that border security. So <coughs> border security first, then that. In terms of what can you do about the military and the money coming out of it? Well, if we send the person up there to be an ally of President Trump, you'll have a lot more sway with the administration when it comes time to dealing out where that money's coming from. And right now, our congressional delegation has some problems with President Trump. So putting someone up there who's a staunch ally. One of the reasons I'm running, Plato said, the penalty for not participating in government is to be governed by your inferiors. One of the reasons I ran is I said, if I, can't, if I don't go and do it, I shouldn't look myself in the mirror and complain about what's going on. So that is part of why I did that, along with wanting to go up and help President Trump on the economy, on the wall, and on the military. Thank you. Thank you. And number two on the list is Dr. Joan Perry. You all are having to make a difficult decision as you look at the candidates that have been up here this evening. Um, 
I think I'm different, and I will distinguish myself first, as I mentioned prior, by being a Christian pro-life pediatrician. Um, secondly, as a political outsider. And thirdly, I believe I bring a unique skill set that's needed in Washington. Because you women who have been mothers and maybe grandmothers know that even in our home, we have to be excellent problem solvers. In the course of raising our family, we also, our five sons, we also brought in over 20 individuals who were youth and young adults um, who just needed the experience of having a stable home. That's problem solving on another level. But then in the private sector, um, working with families for three decades, many uh, of whom have amazing difficulties um, in their lives, I think I have a unique, unique perspective in that way. Um, also being so intricately involved in the community, I feel as though I have my pulse on the, the pulse, excuse me, my finger on the pulse of Eastern North Carolina. Um, and I think we need that kind of fresh face in Washington. When I was little, my father would put a Band-Aid on my knee and say, wouldn't it be great to be a doctor? He had a great hope for our country. Um, I've had that privilege, and now I want my children to have the privilege of the same freedoms and choices that we have had, but I see that they're disappearing. I'd like to go to Washington and be a spokesperson for those values. Next up is uh, Phil Law. We've got a lot of problems here in the 3rd District, but I'm uniquely qualified to handle these challenges as a new generation of leadership emerges. As a Marine in Iraq, seeing combat up close, I learned a lot of hard lessons fast. As a businessman, I've learned even more. With my IT background, it uniquely enables me to handle these challenges. Look, I'm running not to replace Walter Jones, because that just can't happen. I'm running because illegal immigration is killing our country, and our veterans both on and off the battlefield need help, where they are regulated to a third-class health system when an illegal immigrant can come straight across the border and get uh, immediate attention. Onslow County has a unique opportunity to elect the next congressman from here. Last year, just last year, I ran. I won Onslow County by 15% against a 20-year incumbent and a strong challenger. It can happen. I need your support. God bless you all, and God bless America, because it's worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's see if we get this right. Michael Speciale. <laughs> I've been trying that for like, I don't know, how many years you've been in, <laughs> in the house? A lot. I, uh, I want to start off by thanking the chamber for putting this on. I want to thank you for being able to repeat those questions like 20-something times. Uh, so that's it. Uh, this is not another notch on my belt. This is not a uh, uh, for self-aggrandizement. I'm running because... the. The people that I've served for the last six or seven years uh, are happy with what I've done. Uh, I told them when I initially ran that I am a conservative. And what that means is I believe in those things that made this country great. God, country, family, personal responsibility, free market, uh, all life, the Second Amendment, all, all of the things that are important to Americans. And, and what we believe, what conservatives believe, is middle America. Don't let the TV fool you. Don't let the, uh, the left kid you. What we believe is what most of America believes. It, go to the, to the prairies of Illinois, uh, and you'll find out they believe the same thing. In Peoria, Illinois, and, and in Indiana, and in Iowa, what we believe is what America believes. And this is what we need to fight for. And we are, as a group, starting to stand up for America. And that's why things are changing. I have great constituent service. I intend to continue that. Walter Jones had the best in the country. He's been rated best in the country. That will continue. I'm doing this because the people asked me to do it, and I believe that if you can do something, you should. Thank you. God bless America. I ask for your vote, and thank you for all you do. Paul Beaumont. <clears throat> My name is Paul Beaumont. I'm a Curtis County Commissioner. I've been elected to office. That doesn't make me a politician. I haven't been groomed for running for the next step in uh, uh, politics. I'm a guy that comes in to get a job done, and that's why I'm running. There's three core phrases that I use to describe my candidacy. I'm a Christian, I'm a conservative, and I'm committed. I'm a Christian as a way of life and as a relationship, not as a merit badge. Because I'm a Christian, I'm pro-life. Life begins at conception. 
and I have 11 kids to kind of demonstrate that aspect. <laughs> As a conservative, I believe that there's wasteful spending in our government, that that can be used to offset the construction of the wall. The way government funding works and our budget works, the money for the wall probably has to come from facilities and from structures and infrastructure. You can't just cut a budget and apply that money in a different category. Finally, I'm committed. I'm committed to my wife, I'm committed to my family, I'm committed to my district, and I'm committed to the families of this district as well. I would ask for your support. Let me help you become something special in North Carolina. We need infrastructure improvements. I-87 is a classic example that would help bring employment to the, one of the worst districts of unemployment in this state. Thank you very much. Beaumont for Congress. Graham Boyd. Okay, so one of the questions that I didn't uh, get an opportunity to answer a moment ago was about the, the, um, the VA and the veteran services and so forth. And I just wanted to share a quick little story. My dad will be 86 in a couple of weeks on uh, April the 10th. He's a Navy veteran aboard ship. And for the last 10 or 12, 15 years, he's had uh, difficulty hearing. In fact, effectively, he had lost his hearing as a result of that, that tenure. And it wasn't until President Trump became uh, the, the leader in the White House and made some reform changes that he finally was able, after multiple trips to Jacksonville, Greenville, different places, to get some hearing aids. And the night that they were in, there's this new technology. He came back in and said, I heard the crickets and the frogs for the first time in over 10 years. And have these floors always squeaked? Because it's the house that he grew up in. We said, yes, Dad. And so the miracle of, of serving that. And then I'm concerned about those young veterans maybe your generation feel that come back. I think the statistic is 35 a day that commit suicide. We've got to do something there as well with reg regards to helping our military veterans transition into, into the system. In the last few seconds, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I certainly want to ask for your vote. My values, you know, a farm background. They are certainly faith, family, and freedom. And those are the things that I will be a tireless worker for on your behalf, uh, if elected. I made a careful, deliberate decision. I was one of the last to file for office, and I'm doing it because I feel led to do it and encouraged by so many. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight. Michael Pavement. Again, thanks everyone for uh, taking the time to come out. Again, my name is Mike Payment, running for Congress. I'd appreciate your support and vote. Um, uh, again, I am a current commissioner. I'm a, a Christian, a conservative. I believe in less government. Um, you know, I am pro-life. Um, you know, seeing my grandchildren for the first time and when they're born, is, there's nothing like it. I'll never support anything that's going to harm a life. Uh, I believe in the Second Amendment. I will support that. I do have concealed. I'm a hunter. Uh, I believe in the gun rights. Um, you know, I, I understand the economy. I will be someone who can work hard for you. I've been there. I've been in the trenches. I know what it's like. Uh, I've been to D.C. fighting for businesses, fighting for individuals. I can still, I can stand up strong for you in here. I will be effective equally and fairly across the board for all this entire district. Um, I just ask for your support on April 30th. Uh, there's a lot more that I have to offer. You can visit my uh, website at Mike Payment for Congress. You can go to my Facebook page. Uh, I have a lot more information on that. Uh, Mike Payment for United States House. And um, again, just on April 30th. If you want someone who can represent you and do what I told you I would do, I, you know, I, I would appreciate and respectfully ask for your support again. Mike Payment for Congress. Thank you. Gary Sierras. We'll just correct you there. It's Gary Sierras. <laughs> but um, let me first say that any one of us up here are preferable to the extremism offered by the Democrats. Let me just get that straight right away. Um, I'm going to quote to you something. The proposed Constitution delegates to the federal government powers which are limited and defined, to the state governments powers which are numerous and indefinite. This was written by James Madison in Federalist 45 in 1788. 230 years later, we have a $4.17 trillion budget of an abomination. Every single dollar of it represents freedom that each one of the people in this room has lost. Every single time we talk about expanding a government program, it means less liberty and less freedom for everyone in this room. 
I have heard some of my opponents talk about new alternative government programs for health care. I reject that. I don't remember any place in the Constitution giving the federal government the power to take over one-eighth of the United States economy. I do not remember any part of the Constitution giving the government the right to take life from our individual citizens that are unborn. And I just ask for your support as the working class candidate and the working class person with solutions and not just talking points. Thank you. Phil Shepard. Thank you again for letting us be here tonight. First of all, I want to say you honored me by allowing me to be elected as your representative to go to Raleigh in 2010 and 2011. When I got there, our state was in a mess uh, financially. Uh, unemployment was 10 to 14 percent. Uh, we had millions of dollars in debt to Medicaid, uh, also unemployment insurance and so forth. We were overregulated by the federal government and by the state. And we changed all that. We deregulated. We dropped income taxes, dropped corporate taxes. And now we're one of the best states in the country to do business with. We made all those changes. I've been in the fire. I've been there to go through that. And I supported that. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-NRA. I support the right to bear arms. I also believe in a balanced budget. Our state has a balanced budget. And I support the balanced budget amendment and would if elected to Congress. Also, I believe in term limits. I signed the pledge for term limits. I support that. At the same time, I will do all I can to work for you as I've done in uh, Raleigh. I work with Congressman Jones's office on VA benefits and things with the IRS, with citizens in Oslo County and District 15, and we accomplished quite a bit. And I'll continue to serve you and represent you the best of my ability. It's because of what God has done in my life a year and a half ago. Uh, he gave me another opportunity through the kidney transplant. I'm doing well now. Uh, I'm healthy, and I love Eastern North Carolina. I love you all, and I thank God for you, and God bless you, and God bless America. Vote Phil Shepard for Congress. Michelle Nix. Thank you. Thank you, everyone in the audience who came out to hear us today. And thank you for those at home who are watching and listening. My story is a little different than most of the people that are up here. I graduated high school in 1984 at 18 years old. And like any 18-year-old, you think you know everything. Well, two years later and two children later, I found out I didn't know much at all because I was that young woman who was receiving public assistance. I worked hard to get myself and my family off of public assistance because I know and I realize and understand that there's a better way of life for people. But if it was up to the likes of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Nancy Pelosi, I would still be a victim receiving public assistance. I would not be standing here before you today to be the American dream and the success story that I am. After working very hard to get myself and my family off of public assistance, we moved to North Carolina in 1998. And I studied to take my Series 7. And when I was doing that, my children were doing their homework because I wanted to set the example for them and show them that hard work and dedication, you can't achieve the American dream. I went to work for a firm. And when I did, that book started. It was very low. It was $25 million. And when I resigned to run for this position, it was work, worth $132 million. I know what it's like to work for what you want, and if you elect me to Congress, I will work just as hard for you to share my American dream with everyone in the 3rd Congressional District. Thank you. Dr. Greg Murphy. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for coming out. I feel like I can give everybody stump speech, so don't we all feel like that? We've done that enough. When I came into this process, I thought about where we were. Our forefathers came 200 plus years ago and put forth our constitution as the guiding document for this country. This is how the, company is, the country is supposed to be now. We look at what future we have now for our children and our grandchildren, and personally, it scares me. I look at our economy. Our economy is out of control. We cannot keep spending that the way that we have. I truly believe that we have to have a balanced budget. budget. And our state actually does it. We actually plan, how to, plan uh, how to pay money for the future. There's no reason our national government shouldn't be able to do that. There is obvious waste in our government, and it goes through an entitlement situation that now we feel like the government should hand us out everything that we need. 
We're at a crossroads. We're truly at a crossroads in our country where a liberal left is pushing us in so far in one direction that it is horrible for our future. Whoever you represent isn't just one vote that goes to Congress. That one person that you vote to go to Congress needs to be someone that actually takes initiative and can change other people's votes. They have to be persuasive. They have to have the ability to be innovative, to be able to analyze, and actually look at other individuals and persuade them to our conservative values in eastern North Carolina. I'm Dr. Greg Murphy, and I appreciate your vote for United States Congress. Thank you. Kevin Bako. My mama was born just down the road at Camp Lejeune, and she drove all the way from Currituck today and brought our new little campaign flyers. And I wanted to point out the little cannabis leaf that is incorporated into my name and talk a little bit about what that means to me. First and foremost, it symbolizes compassion. I've witnessed thousands of my own patients benefit from medical cannabis. It also symbolizes prosperity. The economic potential of hemp in a free market is off the charts. This cannabis leaf also symbolizes liberty. And I wish my, my fellow Republicans would join me in acknowledging how contrary to the principles of liberty, prohibition, and the drug war are. But you know what else this symbolizes to me? It's the future. And the future is staring us right in the face. And we have the opportunity to embrace it and prosper. Or we can hem and haw in fear. I choose to embrace it. And I know a lot of North Carolinians would join me in that. This is just a symbol for many of the things that I stand for. But I think it's a good one. I hope you'll visit my website, kevinbakoforcongress.com. Thank you. Eric Rouse. Yeah, Eric Rouse. Rouse for the house. Um, you know, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina farming, so I know a little bit about work. When, uh, when I was out of school, I had to ride a tractor. And later on in life, when my father started his electrical company, when I was out of school, I had to get up in the morning, jump in a truck so I could be at a job site at 7 o'clock in Raleigh or at the coast. I know a little bit about working. I grew up my whole life working. That's what you did. That's what I'll do for you when I'm in Congress if you choose to elect me. One thing, though, whoever does get the nomination, we all need to support them. I think we all agree about that. But... If you would, I encourage you to go to my website, rouseforthehouse.com. I'm going to try and say that three times before this is over so it'll burn in. But uh, it, you can learn a lot about me. You can learn a lot about what I've done. Uh, as a farmer growing up, I've got a lot of support from the farmers. Joey Carter, who was being sued by the lawyers, is, is on my side. He, he believes I can help him out. Michael Hill, who's a farmer, believes I can help him out, and I will. I'll go up there and I'll try and help. I will fight. That's one thing I can do. I've been successful through persistence, and that's what we've got to be. We've got to be persistent, and we've got to wear them down. We've got to get in there and do what's right and get the things that we want. Again, my name is Eric Rouse. Rouse for the House. Thank you. And Celeste Cairns. Guys, I'm hoping that in my life experiences, you will see someone who will represent you well. Something I did not talk about was the life issue. I think everybody up here says they're pro-life. I have no reason to believe that they're not. I will tell you that I've had my hands and feet involved in this issue. I did serve as a volunteer counselor at a crisis pregnancy center, and I also have served on your board of directors here for your, the Owenslow Pregnancy Resource Center for the last three years. As an accounting and auditing person, as a CPA, I hope you see in me someone who can do math and can look at the problem with the debt and some of the programs and understand that I will 
address them well. I will say to Mr. Payment, there is no cookie jar. <laughs> cookie jar was devoid of cookies long ago. We now have two to three workers for every beneficiary. We, for the last nine years or so, have taken in less income in payroll taxes than we're paying out. My 24 years as a military wife, I want you to know that I've seen, I had to watch my husband as a Green Beret go off to war and deploy and also wept with the wives whose husbands did not come home. So I'm not a traditional candidate at all, but I hope you know that I would do my very best to represent this district well. CelesteForCongress.com. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all. I think they have more than earned a round of applause for sticking with the rules and doing a great job. Thank all the candidates for being with us for this very important event. And Elliot, congratulations to you. That was I a I long was out haul. Of the water here. <laughs> <laughs> also, again, we'd like to thank our corporate sponsor, Sandra's Ford, uh, the city of Jacksonville for the use of these wonderful facilities <clears throat> and their media services. Now, if you missed any part of the forum onslow, just check the listings for G10 for the rebroadcast dates and times. And remember, your vote does count. Absentee ballot request forms are now available online at Oslo County Board of Elections website. You can also find the dates, times, and location for the early one-stop voting. Election day is April 30th from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. at your local precinct. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, thank you for joining us for our Meet the Candidates Forum, and this concludes our program. Thank <laughs> you.